Okay, so coming back for the second part of our light notes. Let me get myself a little pen here. Um, we are going to get into the emission spectrum, which are super cool. It's what your lab is going to be about um, when we do some spectrometry. And just a couple of definitions here. Go ahead and write these down. Um, you've got ground state, which is the lowest energy state of an electron. An excited state is when the electron has absorbed some energy and jumped up to a higher energy level. And I'll explain more about this stuff in class. Um, you have the bright line spectrum, which is, um, it's like when you take white light from the sun and you pass it through a prism, you get the full-on rainbow. Well, whenever you do specific elements um, that are excited, you know, you, you light up a gas in, a, in a, a little like neon tube type of thing. It's really called a fluorescent tube. And then you take the color that is given off by that particular gas and then pass it through a prism. It actually separates it into that element's specific spectra. And you can use the spectra to identify different elements the same way that you can use your fingerprints to identify you. And scientists have used this. They've like aimed giant spectrometers at stars and figured out which elements are present in the stars and then use that to figure out the age of the stars and, you know, what sources they might have had and, and you know, how the universe is expanding. We've done all kinds of really cool things with this. So... <coughs> Sorry. We left off with Rutherford's model, and he, you know, shot alpha particles at a gold foil, piece of gold foil, and they, like, you know, went off in some crazy directions every once in a while. And so, you know, Rutherford kind of figured out the whole nucleus thing. <coughs> but Rutherford just kind of said, okay, I found these positive things, and I know that an atom is neutral, so that means there has to be some kind of negative particle in there. And he, I don't know why he called him the electron, but he went ahead and named them. But he didn't know where they were located. And he didn't know what kept those electrons from being just sucked into the nucleus. Because if an electron is negatively charged and the nucleus is positively charged, well, opposites attract. So why wouldn't the electrons get drawn into the nucleus? Well, that leads us to Bohr. And Bohr came up with an idea of how the electrons orbit around the nucleus the same way the planets orbit around the sun. And so it's the centrifugal force of the electrons orbiting around the nucleus that prevents them from slamming into the nucleus. Um, and so he came up with the word orbit, and he said that the electrons follow these very specific orbits. And the farther the electron was from the nucleus, the greater the energy of the electron in that particular shell. A shell is just another name for an energy level. And so what happens is the electrons start in the ground state. They absorb energy, and that causes them to get excited and jump up to a higher energy level. And then when they drop back down, then a photon is emitted. And so like if you had this lovely little nucleus here, here's our nucleus, and you have an electron orbiting around the nucleus. I know this is not a perfect circle, don't laugh at my drawing ability. Well, what would happen is the electron would absorb energy. And when it absorbed energy, the electron actually jumped up to a higher orbit and started orbiting up here. So now we got our little electron zipping around up here. Well, so far you haven't seen anything happen yet. What happens is when this electron then releases the same amount of energy that was absorbed, this is a little photon of light, and the electron then falls back down to its ground state. So it's only when the electron falls back to its ground state that the energy is released in the form of a photon. And this happens over and over and over again once you start exciting a particular sample of an element. <coughs> That leads us to the next model. Bohr's model was awesome, and it was so awesome, you guys probably all learned about it in sixth and seventh grade, but it didn't answer the ever important scientific question of why. Why did those electrons have to stay in specific orbits? Why couldn't the electrons exist anywhere they wanted as long as they stayed within a particular energy level? Well, this great looking dude right here, Louis de Broglie, he pointed out that not only does light behave as waves, but since electrons kind of in a way cause light that the electrons also act like waves. 
And so de Broglie used Planck's equation, E equals Planck's uh, constant little dealy bobber, and uh, knew the, the frequency of a particular wavelength. <coughs> dB is de Broglie. He proved that electrons, yes, they have specific energies, and so they belong in a specific energy level, and they can absorb and release energy by jumping from one level to the other, but that Bohr's little specific orbits, like planets circling a sun, that's not actually right. Hang on, the quantized orbits were actually, that should be incorrect. So the, the specific energies, yes. The specific orbits, no. Then we get to this guy. He's probably the best looking scientist that I've ever researched. His name was Heisenberg. And he came up with the uncertainty principle. And I'm not going to get into real big detail about this. But he basically said that it's impossible to determine both the location and the velocity of an electron. Because the simple act of finding an electron changes its velocity. And the simple act of trying to measure the velocity of an electron changes its location. So you can't do both. You can do one or the other. And you can say, oh, I know an electron was here, or that there is a possibility of an electron being at this point in the electron cloud. But you can't determine both. And Schrodinger wave equation, I, I don't really care that you know anything about this, except that Schrodinger came along, and he just gave more support to Bohr's model and quantum theory. And that's really, you know, the energy levels he supported, the orbits he did not. I used to call these things train tracks. It was like the electrons were trains following on a train track and they couldn't get off the train tracks. But he definitely supported the energy levels, which we still study today. You know, right now we currently have seven possible energy levels for the electrons. Uh, but the whole orbit thing was proven wrong. But he still did an awesome job. Bohr is still very well-respected and well, you know, much talked about scientist. So even though he was wrong about the orbits, he was good on the energy levels. And then from there, we go into electron configuration and you guys can have super duper fun with that. So have a great day and I'll see y'all later.